I'd like to invite you to turn your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. A lot of reference is made to these verses within sermons. You don't hear a lot of sermons from just these verses. If you remember, several months ago, we went through a study on Wednesday nights in the book of Ephesians, and I made very little comment on these two verses, and I said the reason why is because I I feel like they deserve a message all to themselves. And so we're not in a series, we don't have a theme going on on Sunday nights at the moment, so I thought this is a good time to consider what God is able to do. There's a grandfather that tells a story about his granddaughter running from a dog, and this dog is barking at this little girl. He's gaining on this girl, and she's running, and all of a sudden she sees her grandpa, and she makes her way to him, jumps in his arms, the dog stops at her feet, stops barking. She looks at her grandpa, looks down at the dog, looks back up at her grandpa and sees that she is no longer threatened. You know, it's good to be close to someone who loves us. It's good to be close to someone who has more power than we do. Verse 20, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. We're encouraged here in the Scriptures that there is no limit to what God can do. Our minds and our thought process cannot rise to the place of all of the things that God can do no matter how deeply we imagined them. Whatever we need, He is able. Whatever trouble we face, He is able. That's not to say that God is going to do everything for us according to the way we ask. If we just simply trust Him by faith, it's not saying He's going to do everything that we want or or greater than we want. That's possible. He may. We we may ask God, and, and He may let us know we've been aiming low. And He may bless us abundantly above those things. But sometimes it's different, and we have to realize that we don't see the big picture like God does. Things that happen for God's glory, they might appear gloomy initially. But hang on, because God may be up to something that we have no idea about. Notice the verse does not tell us what God is going to do, but the verse says what God is able to do. And in saying that, He does amazing things, and we're never going to discover some of those things that He has done until we get to heaven. We don't deserve these things that God does for us. But there are also going to be some things that He does, and you and I are simply going to delight in those things. God is able. Now unto Him that is able. How do we expound on this? Well, it it talks about how He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power 
that worketh in us. So as we consider how able God is tonight, let's go ahead and consider God's power in a few areas that we know of tonight. Let's consider His power to create. I mean, God spoke the universe into existence. And He did so out of nothing but His Word. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, as we consider creation and the existence of it, it says, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead. So they are without excuse. In the 33rd Psalm, verse 6 says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of His mouth. 33, 9. For He spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Everywhere, all around us, every day, we have evidence in nature of the creation of Almighty God and what He has done in His power. It reminds us of the power of God every day. You might even consider the complexity in creation. Or you might even consider the continuance of creation and how it's maintained and kept. And it all just shouts to us, God is mighty in power. And this is your personal God. This is your Father. He has power to create. But we also might consider how God has power to judge. He judged the entire world in a flood, in Noah's day. The event we know as the Tower of Babel, He did there confound the language of all the earth. He destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah in all their pride. He pressed upon Pharaoh with plagues. He took the Egyptian army and drowned them in the sea. His power is seen in His judgment. His power is also seen in His saving. God is mighty to save. Still today, you might think of Paul going down that road to Damascus and he was looking for those who were in the way. You know, Jesus is the way. He was looking for Christians And He was going to have them pelted with rocks. He was going to punish them. He was going to persecute them. He was going to have them put into prison any way that He could. And then He was thrown to the ground in a meeting with the Lord. Convicted of His sin. And and Paul called Jesus Lord. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Paul trusted in Jesus Christ right there. He was saved. He was changed right then and there by the Lord. He's mighty, mighty to save. As we have studied in the past, these these chapters of this book, we know that in the first three chapters, Paul was, was expounding on doctrine. And then in the last three, it was duty. And in those first three, Paul spoke much about the power of the Lord. Here in Ephesians, in chapter 1, verse 19, he spoke of the exceeding greatness of God's power, which raised Christ from the dead. In chapter 3, verse 7, Paul writes that he was made a minister according to the grace of God by the power of God. In chapter 3, verse 16, he mentions the power of the Holy Spirit strengthening the inner man. The power of God. He's powerful to save. When the disciples asked Jesus, who can be saved? He said, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. 
Know that salvation has nothing to do with man, but a decision that the power of the gospel leads us to. You know, the power of the gospel leads us to make a decision about it. To either accept it or to reject it. And when we receive Him, when we'll choose to receive Jesus, He saves. Saves us from all of our sins. His By that blood that, that washes all of our sins away, He is mighty to save still today. And how about something that we might think of every day in our lives? He has power to the powerless. You know, we will find ourselves overmatched by life's difficulties by divine design. God permits it or God places it in our lives simply so He can show us His great power that He's willing to put forth in our lives. Think about Abraham and Sarah. And God taking this couple and giving them a child. They weren't of the age to have a child any longer, yet God gave a child to them and He showed His power. He gave sight to the blind man. He showed up to Lazarus way late, everybody thought. But then there was the resurrection of Lazarus from death. He parted the sea so Israel could escape Egypt. And the Lord asked the question in His Word, Is anything too hard for the Lord? You know, Gideon was well outnumbered from the get-go. 32,000. And God dwindled that army of His down to 300. Gideon got the victory. But what did everybody know about that victory, that it was the Lord's. There was no doubt about it that it was not man's hand that delivered them from the enemy. It was Almighty God. It wasn't the sword of Gideon. It was the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Noah and his family survived this worldwide flood. Noah could not build a boat. To survive that flood. But the Bible says that Noah walked with God. You know what Noah did? He talked with God. He talked to a great ark builder. Who told him exactly how to do it. To the saving of his family. Hebrews 11 gives us many examples of the heroes of faith. A lot of success stories. Because they had faith in the one with all power. They trusted Him. And we read these stories and we're very encouraged by these actual events that took place by those who placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And God delivered them. They received many promises in this life. They believed God's Word and God came forth on His promises up to the middle of verse 35. When you go to Hebrews 11 and you go from the middle of verse 35 on through the end of the chapter, you find some different stories. You find those who died. You find those who didn't receive the promises on this earth by faith. There was nothing wrong with their faith, by the way. The Bible says they had a good report through faith. It's not about faith and faith. It's about who our faith is in. And they had a good report through faith, yet they didn't receive the promise in this life. Do we ever, many people avoid the end of Hebrews chapter 11. Do we ever think about God's power to divinely heal them forever and take them to heaven? 
Do we think about what it says there that God had something better for them? God had something better in mind? It's far better to be with Christ, the Bible says. God had power to take them home, to eternally heal them. Nothing that happens is ever a result of a lack of power from the Lord. That will never be in the scenario. It should never be a thought. It will never happen. God is able. God is able by His power. And, and we could bring up several other things. Let's just say tonight that, that God is able by His goodness. You know, Satan tempted Eve to believe that God's instructions, that God's commands were not good. And I just wonder how many of us children of God are tempted in our times to doubt God's goodness. The, tempt the temptation is always coming at us. Satan did it to Eve. He's still trying to do it to the people of God today. To get us to doubt how, God good, how good God is as we go through our struggles of life. That, that our minds would just stay on our struggles and we would focus on our struggles and not the Scriptures and not the Savior. That we might doubt God's goodness. That's what He wants. How much does God care for us? We ever doubted that? You know, Peter says, Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Right at, that is, that is the first letter Peter wrote. And it's chapter 5 and verse 7. Right after that, he said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom, res whom resist steadfast in the faith. When problems arise, we're to remember God's goodness. We're to remember that He cares for us. So many people love that saying, God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. You know, I, I know a man who had something happen in his life years ago, and when it happened, he was stunned, and he said, God, what did I do to deserve this? And then as time went on, he found out, he thought that, that that trial became something beautiful in his life. And he later said, God, what did I do to deserve this? God is always at work. God cares for you and I. When, say, when things seem bad, God is up to something good. He is always working for our good. We're not to have a grudge against God, but, but give Him our griefs. And when we give Him our griefs, we can experience His goodness along the way. God is able. He's able by His power, and He's able by His goodness. Unto Him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. God is able by His power, by His goodness. How about we look at for His glory in verse 21. Unto Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. You know, it would be sin for us to, de to desire glory. But God is righteous to command us to give Him glory. If God were not who He was, there would be no one or nothing to give glory to. But, 
But God is God and He is on His throne and He is righteous, He's perfect, He's eternal, He cares for us, He is able, He has power, He has goodness, and He commands that we give Him glory. And it is good for you and I to give God glory. It's good for us to give Him glory. It's a good thing for us. It's good that we have God to give glory to. I'll tell you a good place to give Him glory. That's in His church. That's, that's where He commands we give Him glory. Is in His church. It's a good place to give Him glory. That's what we're to do when we gather here. God's given us a purpose in His church. He's given us a focus when we gather as the church to give Him glory. Let there be glory in His house, He says. That ought to be on our minds every Sunday morning. Every service that we have. We have gathered to give God glory. You know how we give God glory? By unity. You know, this is, this is the middle of this book of Ephesians. And as we went through it, I told you, it was my first time to completely teach this entire book. I preached sermons all through it. But we went through the whole thing. And I was amazed... At how much focus there was given to unity. Unity in the church. Unity among the believers. Chapter 4 verse 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Let me just go on. There is one body, one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Glory given to God by unity. Verse 13, till we all, well, let me go back to verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Okay, one more. Chapter 5, verse 21. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. We give glory to God in His church by way of unity together. You know, no other institution on the face of this earth has been filled with such power, such love, such goodness as what God has bestowed upon His church. And we ought to show it by harmony with one another. Harmony with one another. It gives glory to the Lord. We're to be in unity. Unity gives glory to God. We can do so Because of redemption. We have been redeemed. The Bible says. It it tells us all through this book here. It tells us in chapter 2. Chapter 2 tells us that we were dead in trespasses and sins. But He has raised us up together. And made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ. We have been quickened together with Christ for the glory of God. Let there be glory in the church. Give God glory by unity in the church. Give God glory because we're able to, because we have been redeemed by the Lord. Jesus loves His church. My Bible tells me, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave Himself for it. That church he started during his earthly ministry. That he gave his life for. That he sacrificed for. That he loves. His church that will be in this world when he comes to the clouds. Aren't you glad God's going to have some true churches here? When he comes back to get us. We know that God is going to have his house here. For glory to be given. Till he comes And returns to the clouds and takes us back. And then we're going to one big church. All races, all faces, together 
all, all the, the middle wall of partition, everything's been torn down, and we're all going to be in one big church to give God glory. And there's going to be a wonderful pastor that's going to know everything that's going on, everything about it. Jesus Christ is going to be the pastor of this one church in heaven. And you know what we're going to do there? We're going to give God glory. We're going to give God glory endlessly. It's going to be going on all the time. That's what we're going to do is glorify God. I'm glad we're able to to learn how to do that now. I'm glad that He has left His church in this world. His, His Word, His Holy Spirit within the lives of, of His believers. You know, there's a saying, to live above with the saints we love, that will be glory. But to live below with the saints we know, well, that's another story. We say that, and we can relate to that in some ways, but... But, verse 20 says, Now unto Him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. Okay? It's God's command by God's enabling through His power and His goodness that we give Him glory in the church. You know, the context of this verse, it has to do with the church. We're to give Him glory in the church. But we know that the church is the people. And, and so the way we're going to give Him glory in the church is as individual Christians first. That our lives might be lived in such a way that brings Him glory. Chapter 4 of this book, verse 16, says, From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. What, what did I just read? Every joint supplieth. Everyone is part of it. Everyone contributes. So we must ask ourselves the question tonight, individually as children of God, is this what we're doing? Are we living individually for God's glory? Because that's how we come together to give glory to God in the church. It, that's what it takes from every single member for us to have glory in the church for the Lord. That can happen for every single one of us because God is able. As we think about His power through creation, through judgment, through salvation, we consider the power of God and we can consider it personally tonight in our own lives, that we all might say confidently that God is able. And because God is able, how does this affect our lives? Let's just think of a few things as we close. The effect of what God is able to do, let's ask. Let's ask. In other words, let us not be guilty of not having because we don't ask. Your Father is able. Ask Him. Ask the One who is able. Let's ask Him, but also, how might else we be affected by how able God is? Don't doubt. Don't doubt God's ability or His willingness to give to His people. With God, all things are possible. Just because we don't understand some things He does, just because we, we get baffled at what He might allow in our lives, that doesn't mean we're to doubt His ability. Things in life change. Things in this world change, but God never changes. If He was able then for Paul to write it, He's able today for you and I to believe it. But not just to believe it, to be affected by it. That we would ask Him. That we would not doubt. Let me say something else. 
We, we can't disturb Him. We can't disturb God in this sense. If we are calling upon the Lord by faith according to His will, it's not possible to disturb God with anything you bring to Him. Someone asked the preacher one time, what would be things that are too small to bring to God? It doesn't exist. What are things that, that are just too much to be asking of God? It does not exist. When does God get irritated with how much we ask of Him? We cannot disturb God. Let us know this by this word tonight. There is no prayer request too small. There is no request that He can't handle. The Bible says that He spared not His only Son, but delivered Him up for us all. And how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? The Lord invites our endless requests. We can't disturb Him. He is able. How does that affect us? Just to know that God blesses. God will bless. The, God, the Lord will do things in His church above and beyond what saved sinners can do. Laodicea. The church at Laodicea in Revelation, they got a bad grade on their report card because they were in need of nothing. They, had, they could handle it. They could do it themselves. God will bless His church in ways that His people could never imagine. And He does it for many reasons. And one is so that we can see that it's not the hand of man, it's Almighty God, and we'll give Him the glory. We will give Him the glory in His church. I just love those times when the Holy Spirit's leading Paul in his writing, and he just kind of goes off. You know, he, he's been going through three chapters of doctrine, and then he goes through three chapters of duty. But right in the middle of it, right in the middle, he's, he's writing along, and, and he starts talking about that we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that he might be filled with all the fullness of God. And then he continues here. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Paul went off. In praise and glory, right in the center of this book. So we'll just close with this question. Is this the center of our lives? That we know that God is able and that we are giving Him glory. We're going to have a time of invitation tonight and I don't know what might be on your heart. You might need to know that God is able to save. And we can't say this about everything, but we can say tonight that God will save. He, he's able to, and He will do it. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you will do what the Bible tells you to do, if you will admit you're a sinner, if you will confess Jesus Christ with your mouth as Lord and Savior of your life, if you will believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. Will you trust Him tonight? Because God's able to save, and He will do so. He will do so right now if you trust Him. You will be in no wise cast out. He will receive you tonight. And whatever it is that may be going on in the life, child of God. I plan to preach this again down the road in the future. But maybe in spite of me, God helped you with something tonight. You, you can walk home to your prayer closet. 
But while it's stirring your heart, will you give it to God if you haven't this hour yet? Will you give it to Him? And will you trust Him with it tonight? He is able. Let's give Him glory. Let's bow our heads. Father, we do bow before Your presence tonight. Lord, I consider the praises and song that we were able to sing to You this evening as we've gathered, that that we might be filled up to the point where we truly worship You tonight. And Lord, we thank You for such an encouraging word that You have given us from heaven tonight, Lord. We thank You that we might consider how able You are and Your power in our lives. And where I don't know or anyone else here Lord, among the individuals in your house tonight, you know exactly what someone needs. Lord, I pray that you would bless, that you would provide, that your presence would be known in their life in a powerful way, and that you would lead them to victory in whatever they're going through. Lord, bless your people and take care of them tonight. And lead them as you would have them to be led. Father, may we obey you from the heart tonight. By conviction of the Holy Spirit. To move as you would have us to move. As you speak to our hearts. In a silent way. And we pray these things in Jesus name. Amen. If everyone would please stand. Page number 500. When we walk with the Lord in the light.